my Toronto VK on the beat uh, check. Uh, I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love I'm from Toronto where you wanna get the city love I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love That's right. My city love me back Welcome to episode 1378 of Toronto mike proudly brought to you by Great Lakes Brewery, a fiercely independent craft brewery who believes in supporting communities, good times, and brewing amazing beer. Order online for free local home delivery in the GTA. Palma Pasta. Enjoy the taste of fresh, homemade Italian pasta and entrees from Palma Pasta in Mississauga and Oakville. RecycleMyElectronics.ca. Committing to our planet's future means properly recycling our electronics of the past. The Advantaged Investor Podcast from Raymond James, Canada. Valuable perspective for Canadian investors who want to remain knowledgeable, informed, and focused on long-term success. Season 5 of Yes, We Are Open, an award-winning podcast for Moneris, hosted by FOTML Grego and Redley Funeral Home, pillars of the community since 1921. Today, making his return to Toronto mike is Stephen Stanley. Welcome back, Stephen. So good to be back, Mike. Thanks for having me. Do your buddies call you Steve? Or do you, you prefer Stephen? There was a very short period in, uh, so so uh, Ron Hawkins and Dave Alexander know me as Steve. My mom did not want me to call Steve. She wanted Stephen, but there was a period of time. But I kind of stick with Stephen now. Okay, I have a brother named Stephen, and he's also the PH Stephen. Right. Because you're also a PhD. But there's V Stevens out there. There's lots of V Stevens. Sure. They're, uh, they're imposters. <laughs> Where did you Fair come limitations. from? Today I came like, from Wolf Island. You literally Island. got thrown out. So you're straight from Wolf Island? Straight from Wolf Island. Wow. Which is which was uh more complicated by the weather today, but uh as six thirty ferry and after wow. a bit of a alarm mishap. But we made it. We got on the boat and uh yeah, and we arrived like two minutes before our start time. So like, good. like you literally. Uh, so who drove you here? That's my partner, Leanne. Drove okay, me. so Leanne literally just like came to a rolling stop and <laughs> you rolled out. out. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you're here on time, and Wolf yeah. Island. So, so Wolf Island is now home for you. Wolf Island's home. Yeah. So it, it was a uh, started off as first going there to play hockey, and then ended up uh, working with Chris Brown, and you worked on two records with him now. And then, uh, yeah. and then, then eventually home. So, and you did a tour, of course, with uh, Chris Brown and uh, Ron Hawkins. Yes, and one of our favorite stops was here. At, uh, when so, we, yeah, we you know what? To you. So it I watched. Uh, I was at the premiere for the uh, Subversives, yes. the lowest of the low documentary by Simon Head. And of course, you're in that thing. Uh, mm. Of course, you're a founding member of Lowest of the Low. But uh, it's there's a moment in the doc where Simon Head he he sets it up with the reveal that you and Ron Hawkins toured together. Yeah. So he's building it up. And then there's a moment, somebody says like something like, will Stephen Stanley and Ron Hawkins ever play together again? Like this is like, an, <laughs> and I almost yelled at the screen. Yeah. In my basement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time the movie was being made, we were only just discussing that idea. And now we've done two tours and that was with Chris Brown too, who was a the guy that produced both of my last records and a good friend of mine. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's it uh, in the movie. You're right. It's like there's a bit of a reveal of something sure. that's already happened. So. But but that, that was a fun moment for yeah. me, just because uh, you guys were so great down here, and uh, it's awesome. All three of you are FOTMs. Always good to see you. Uh, I'm gonna just let the listeners know that this is your third visit. Yes. And your first visit. This is gonna blow your mind. You ready? This is. It was over six years ago. Yeah, well, so have we not like sort of compressed the last four years into like maybe one year? It's like whenever, whenever right. somebody says, when did that happen? And you go, oh, it was two years ago. Oh, no, nothing right. happened two years ago. <laughs> That's a good like, point. Yeah. So November 2017, you came over. It was episode 282. So today's episode is 1,378, That's but amazing. you were there 282. Mike and Stephen Stanley chat about his career in music as part of Lowest of the Low and the Stephen Stanley Band. Yeah. And then they played, we played your 10 favorite songs of all time, and it right. was about 90 minutes. But you came back with, with Ron Hawkins and, as I like to call him, Hugh Christopher Brown. Yes. 
<laughs> that's a yeah. That's an important distinction. It's, his name is actually Hugh Christopher Brown, but everybody right. just knows him as Chris. So right, and that name was co-opted, uh, Chris Brown. Yeah. So he's a few times, yeah. <laughs> a few times. <laughs> also by my painter. Shout out to my painter. <laughs> so uh, episode one thousand one hundred and twelve. You were one away from having eleven eleven. Like wow. we should have timed that better. Yeah, yeah. September twenty twenty. I should have timed this to November too, because uh, twenty seventeen. Right. So six years ago, to the almost to the month. So. Your, your day off. Okay. So Mike was. This is Ron Hawkins, Stephen Stanley, and Hugh Christopher Brown. We discussed, uh, you know, Bourbon Tabernacle Choir. We discussed lowest of the low. We talked about your tour. That was fantastic. So I'll do a little housekeeping now, mm-hmm. and then we'll really, you know, we'll find out what's new with you. I'm hoping you'll chat with me about your late great friend uh, Dave Bookman, and I want to hear all about the new music. A lot of ground to cover here, but let me just do a little housekeeping, which is to tell everybody listening right now, in eight days, that's December 9, 2023, in case you're listening in the far off future, hello from the past, hello from 2023. Mm -hmm. What happened, Stephen? Like, what happened? We don't know. Somebody's listening five years from now, and they're like, you have no idea what's coming in 2024. But okay, (laughs) so... TMLX14 is happening at Palma's Kitchen. That's the location in Mississauga of Palma Pasta that's near like Mavis and Burnham Thorpe. It is wonderful. We have a whole floor that's going to be taken over by FOTMs like you. So if you can hear my voice, you're invited. Yes, the pasta is on the house. Uh, Palma Pasta will buy you a meal. Also, Great Lakes Brewery will buy you a beer. So you get free beer. <laughs> I had you at free. Free beer free pasta. We're going to have a live recording. There's an open mic. If you want, you can come on the open mic and say hi to us and be a part of that episode we're recording. It's going to be great. Next Saturday, I'm sure Stephen can make it because he'll be on Wolf Island. I'll be on Wolf Island that night. I'm playing in Kingston on the 10th, I think. Um, That sounds great, though. And what anniversary is this for you? Well, that's the TMLX 14, which means the 14th Toronto Mic listener experience. That's amazing. One day we'll get you to one, Stephen. Yeah, I'd love to. Stars align. Okay, and then we'll make you play. You brought a guitar today. I did, yeah. So you'll play something from the new album. Sure. What's the new album called? The new album's called Before the Collapse of the Hive, and uh, it's been out for about, I don't know, like about 10 days now, I guess. Oh, it's fresh. Okay, so I have, I literally loaded up every song on that album. What's the... uh, name referencing there like what's the why did you name it that yeah uh I, there was a there was a theme that became apparent as the album went along but i didn't really have a, a name for it and in the song uh which is on the second side of the vinyl called hornets that which is a song about um hornets and and their sort of uh innate ability to to understand who the perpetrator is attacking them and only attack those those that person or those uh other animals back so before the collapse of the hive is the moment in september usually when the uh hornets kind of are going crazy because they don't know what their life's going to become and they that's why we often get stung by hornets in september because they're they're facing their um you know basically their society collapsing and going to be renewed the next year around but it became about the whole theme of the record which is really about you know hopefully we're catching it but we're just before the collapse of the hive like there's so many things happening right now and that's what a lot of the songs were about you mentioned um my friend dave who dave bookman who passed away that was a big part of our conversations on a daily basis so i'm sort of thinking of this record as like a bit of a continued conversation with him okay let's listen to a little bit of hornets and then we'll come back and talk about dave john wayne at the alamo Last stand. John Wayne in a magazine said they selfishly tried to hang on to their land. The apologist prayers conceived after the smoke has long cleared. Nearer, my God, to me in this godless frontier. Say it's okay, it gets worse every day. It's a storm throw away. Oh, let it live in the trees, let it hum in the breeze, in a world on its knees. 
get stung in late September It's just a last gasp to survive Remember the good old days Before the collapse of the hive Drunk on the power of this stillborn bitter fruit This new cycle hour Don't reveal where they buried the loot You know what I would do, Stephen? I would like just listen to your entire album with you and you could just kind of chime in and explain do, uh, do you like the uh, the director's <laughs> version where we uh, just yeah. talk about the context who's, would, whose uh, voices am i hearing besides yours though yeah so what? that's a real uh, mix of the wolf island records experience because uh the, the piano in there is chris brown and it's a big part of the song and uh the vocals are suzanne jarby who's also on wolf island records and uh kate fenner who was originally from the bourbons and uh, will be at the show tonight too um, what but, show tonight? Tell us the details. Yes, so tonight's the record release party in Toronto at the at the uh, Redwood Theater, which is at uh, Gerard and Greenwood, thirteen hundred Gerard, and uh, things kick off at se- doors are seven, and uh, the show starts at eight, and there will be a few tickets at the door. It's uh, it's it's sold really well, but it's a big place, so we may, we can fit some more people in if you want to come. Yeah, I'll drop. I'm dropping this like five minutes after we take our photo in the rain. Great. So uh, well, yeah, er, eager beavers who jump on this. Uh, speaking of jumping on episodes, uh, again, we'll do a little little more mopping up here before we dive right in. But there's an episode of Toronto Mike recorded yesterday with Dave Hodge. Stephen, do you know Dave Hodge? I do know Dave. I don't know him well, but I've certainly met him a few times through music because he's a, such a huge music fan. I saw he did, I haven't heard it yet, but he did uh, his 100 songs of the year. 100, but he has a rule. He won't repeat an artist twice. So it's his 100th favorite. Yeah. I mean, how many music, even bona fide music fans out there are able to consume at least 100 new albums in a year. Like, I think this guy yeah. is incredible. And, you know, people yeah. know him as a sports guy, but you have no idea. Like, Dave Hodge is a music guy. He has a heart of gold from what I've what I've witnessed, and um, he was also a good friend of Dave's. Um, my first experience w- watching him in uh, a music context was at a Hold Steady show many years yeah. ago. And w- clearly both big fans, and, and he was just loving it. And uh, it was actually, it was them, Hold Steady and the Drive-By Truckers at the Phoenix. Like that's a pretty damn good double bill, but yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's a I've I've met him a few times through the Horseshoe and through doing uh, some events there, and he's often functioning as the MC and uh, just a really good guy to talk to, so, without a doubt. So yeah. he he unveils his 100. I'm sure he will listen to before the collapse of the hive. And Stephen, maybe we'll uh, be kicking you out next year next when year. he comes back for his uh, 100 jams of 2024. If he's got good taste, it'll happen for sure. Okay, so let's. Let's pay tribute. Before we talk bookie, yeah. I was curious about... Uh, let me play a little bit. Yeah. Were you a fan of the Pogues? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. And th- those records mean so much to me. Um, and, you know, and I, I sort of seemed like we were watching a slow decline of Shane over the last several years and um seems like something very specific well longer than on. that i'd say i yeah. feel like it's wild he lived to be 65 years old well that's what a few of my friends have said in the last couple of days is that it's amazing that he made it this far but um you know he did he did rebound a few times and and did solo records did tours um but you know like living hard there's a lot of people that uh aren't here anymore that lived hard through the 80s and 90s and uh it catches up with you eventually right we're human, but it's, it's very sad because it does, especially, you know, this time of year with we're about to enter into the controversial fairy tale of New York City. Oh, because there's an F-slur in there. Yeah, exactly. So what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts in the context of the song and everything, I actually, like, that's not a word I will ever use. Same. But in that song, I'm not offended by its use because of the context of everything. You know, you, you also have to sort of uh, consider the source, and I, I believe Shane McGowan's opinion on that particular case was that he was trying to authentically embody a character and right. that's exactly what that character would say so you know we don't need to celebrate it but i think i don't think we should also be uh, rewriting history when when history is so good like that's a really good well song. there's also the dire straits right money for nothing uh yeah which uh uses the same slur well, so there you go. I would have less affinity for that only because I have less affinity for Dire Straits and for that song. So, um, yeah. So that's not that doesn't make that doesn't make it right. But no. uh, you know, 
in that, uh, yeah, I don't even, I don't even know if I can. It's, really it's tough because um, neither of us are gay men, right? So it's yeah. like, uh, you know, so I'm not offended. It's easy for a straight Mike to say, right? Yeah. But uh, it is problematic in 2023, uh, and it's not the same song without. You know, you don't want to mess with the song, no. which is my favorite Christmas song of all time. And it, it is you, you amazing. Know, so it's, you know, uh, enjoy Pogues, responsibly. Did the Pogues not eventually do a second version of it where they, they? changed? I know like Bon Jovi, John Bon Jovi did an absolutely horrendous oh, yeah, I, that was remake true. of it <laughs> but, where he changed all the words, which I don't know how you But kirsty has been it. gone so long now. I don't yeah. know how they could even recreate because uh, she's such a key part of uh, Christy McCall, such a key part of Fairy Tale yeah. of New York. So I don't oh. even know how you can recreate it. But if uh, it was this year, I would say, you know, very easily with AI and what and whatnot. <laughs> Listen to what the Beatles just did. Um, but yeah, you make a good point. But I do remember hearing it, and I think maybe they just moved some words around and removed that word. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's it like, is it's quite a, the discussion, yeah, though. But it becomes like you know, there's the meme that comes out every time this year. It's like, sorry, we can't play Fairy Tale New York, but here's Cardi B rapping about oh. her ass. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's true. We, Here's our latest, the latest song, Wet Ass Pussy, <laughs> and uh, good, good point there. But uh, great jam, nonetheless, and often I'll, yeah. I said this to Dave yesterday, but uh, it can be July, and it can be 30 degrees, and I will still enjoy hearing Fairy Tale of New York, and I can't say that about any other Christmas song. Well, but there you go. They didn't put it on a Christmas record. It's just on a, yeah. it's on an ordinary record. It, become, it comes up in the sequence of tracks. So chances are, I know for me, the first time you probably heard it wasn't a Christmas. It, in Christmas, it was probably just, well, you listen to a record. And uh, Matt Dillon's in the video. That's right. Yeah, it's actually a really good video, too. It's a really good video. It's just everything it's about that song was perfect. It's a perfect song, and I get the controversy, and as you said, it's not a word I use, and it's not a word I would condone people using. So you have to you have to sort of, yeah, I mean... Enjoy responsibly. Yeah, enjoy responsibly, but it's not it's not our, for you and me, it's not our decision. That's the way I see it. And right. so if, if it becomes known that it's wrong for that to be said, then I would I'll go along with that. How so? You mentioned the new Beatles song "Now yeah. and Then." Uh, I actually asked Dave about this yesterday, so I'm just going to repeat my Dave Hodge episode of you, Stephen. Yeah, okay, uh, except you got a guitar with you; you <laughs> didn't bring a guitar. So, what are your thoughts? A uh, little context is that you have a, a cleaned-up vocal on a tape from the '70s, and you got a yeah. guitar part from George Harrison from the '90s, yeah. and then, of course, still with us, uh, Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney. And what are your thoughts on that way to create art? That well, method. Well, so if my friends showed me the uh, 15 minute video they made, that was sort of an explainer video. Well, and Peter Jackson, I think. Made yeah, it. Peter yeah. Jackson made it. Yeah, and uh, uh, Sean Sean's in it. John Lennon's son is in it, and he's basically saying, "Look, like my dad would have been all over this because, I mean, the Beatles were the Beatles. Like, t seemingly every record they made embraced some new technology. So why wouldn't they have continued to do it?" You know, as a fa the what? So my first thought when I before I'd heard it, I was like, "Oh boy!" Like, like, yeah, that's this maybe right. maybe this isn't the right thing to do. But after hearing it, I'm like, "Oh my god!" This like brings back so many memories. The part of the story that I love is that they they uh, didn't tell the string section that they were recording a Beatles song. But as you listen to those strings, I'm like, "Okay, unless these are all 14 year olds, <laughs> there's no other string section that could be but a Beatles string section." On that um, note, so there is a woman who did strings and is on the song now and then, who actually passed away before the release of oh. uh, Now and Then. And her mom was saying that she would have been tickled pink to know because she had no idea she was recording a Beatles song. Oh man! Like, yeah, and she and I was reading this. Actually, I think it was in the New York Times this article, and I thought that it's very interesting that they kept. Even the uh, artists on the track were kept in well, the they, dark. They told everybody it was a Paul McCartney song. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I understand Paul McCartney could very well be doing something that sure. that uses a very similar beat. But that string arrangement <laughs> is right out of the Beatles handbook. Um, the first thing I heard about the song was don't listen to it on Spotify because it compresses all the good stuff out of it, which, oh. I, to which I did listen to it on Spotify. And I, my first thought was kind of, yeah, it's okay. But then when I've heard it on Better Systems... It's rich. Like, there's a lot going on there, and it's, you know, why not? It's nice to, uh, seeing that George was involved and actually the, seeing a bit more footage of the three of them in the studio. I mean, I revere that stuff. I revere the... Like, yeah, why, I mean, I'm digging it, we? too. And it's yeah. not like, you know, when they use the word AI, you get your back up. Like, you're already, like, D AI. Yeah. But then you, they're only AI just cleaned up, you know, separated the piano and yeah. cleaned up the vocal. It's not like... That John Lennon voice is AI. That's John Lennon's voice. It it's, was just cleaned up by new it's software. It's 100% his voice. And 
when you hear it out of the uh, mix of the track, you can even tell more how much it's John Lennon. I think the mix itself, when I first heard it, I was like, oh, that does sound a little bit overproduced as far as Lennon's voice. But hearing it out of the track, which you do in that video that I was talking about, yeah, um, it's Lennon, for sure. It's wonderful. I think that's uh, George Martin's son who does that, right? Giles? That's right, Giles. So that's, uh, yeah. Enjoy. Like if you yeah. don't if you don't like it, you don't have to listen because there's a lot of you know people who jump on it. Like what an abomination! Like this was a demo for a reason. You're tarnishing. I'm like, chillax. You know, yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> like, if you don't want to listen to it. Don't listen to it. Yeah. You still got the Beatles, like you know, immense catalog. If you're a purist, then just be a purist. It's fine. You got it. You got it. And yeah. I like how you have the mu- musician's ear to hear a difference between the Spotify compressed version and a different version because many of us uh, probably couldn't tell you the difference. Well, I mean, I don't know that I have that great an ear, but it just. Uh, I was prompted to listen to it that way. And because I wanted to hear it quickly, I listened to it on Spotify first. Um, and it does, it does. It just sort of kind of, you know, it's a, it's a lower res file. A little compressed. Yeah, it's compressed. Okay. Last piece of cleanup here is that there's a couple of East Coast musicians who were in the Toronto Mike schedule and then like not so sure because these, these great musicians come from uh, the Maritimes and then they're only in town for like a cup of coffee. But I have lately, Stephen, I've been like, I want to do it live. Like I want it live in the studio. So yeah. a couple of guys, I'll just shout out both very much into being on Toronto Mike. One of which we're going to do next spring when he returns, because we, he couldn't quite make it work. He almost came over the, uh, the great rapper uh, classified. So nice. classified almost here, but says he wants to come on in the spring when he's in Toronto. Cause I want him in the basement. The other guy who's actually flying in tomorrow for a gig at Hughes room and then we're trying to figure it out, but he was going to drop by yesterday at eight, <clears throat> excuse me, but I'm going to be at uh, Horseshoe Tavern tomorrow night watching Junk House. And I told him, uh, if you come, you're going to record with my kid because uh, I won't be here. And that's <laughs> Ashley McIsaac. Oh, nice. So Ashley's interested in coming on. We just got to figure out when he's in. T- anyway, so these are just a couple of East Coast musician updates. I'll try to get Ashley on while he's in town, but he's got a short window and I got other shit going on, right, Stephen? Of course, as we all do, especially this time here. Yeah, lot, lots going on. Okay. Now, please. Remind us mm. about your relationship with Bookie. Well, it grew out of lowest of the low. I mean, he was one of the first people to sort of jump jump on the music and, you know, spend a lot of time talking about us on the, what was the show at the uh, 6 o'clock every live, day? Uh, live in Toronto. Live in Toronto, right? yeah. yeah. So, you know, and that led to the two of us meeting. And after lowest of the low broke up the first time, which was early 95, uh, he and I just sort of started a friendship that that became, you know, really we were really tight, and we, you know, not often he wasn't a, much of an in person guy, but we talked via phone or via text multiple times every day, and uh, you know, so you have this person who's like, I think even unbeknownst to him, is creating this mystique with his love of music and particularly the Canadian indie music that he was really really pushed and and helped and you know i think a lot of what the scene became is because of his hard work and because of well it's not even i don't even know if it was, he certainly he certainly worked hard he certainly uh spent a lot of time researching and putting uh making sure that what he did on air sounded natural but there was actually it was actually a lot of thought went into it beforehand which is amazing um but i wasn't i know it wasn't work for him it was like he didn't he loved it and he loved being part of the scene he loved i mean he was a musician musician himself first when he came to toronto and the bookman right the bookman yeah and uh he continued to play he and i did with uh dave bedini and john delorier did, had a band for a short period of time called the midi ogres and we did a single and then uh Dave and I wrote about nine songs together, and one of them ended up on on my album, the Thin Wild that Thin Wild Mercury, and uh, one of them was an out was an outtake um, a song called um, First Saturday in May, which he wrote about the Kentucky Derby. Um, but yeah, it was just great because I I really enjoyed that too because he would just hand me full sheets of lyrics and say just put music to this, and he wrote in a very he, the, the lyrics kind of told the story of where the song needed to go, so it was a lot of fun doing that with him. Um, but yeah, just you know like watching when when he uh, as you know he passed away quite suddenly, and um, when that happened, there was this sort of deeply personal thing that was going on, but there was also this concurrent realization of how wide his birth was and how much of an effect he had on people and the Toronto music scene. One of the one of the nicest sort of byproducts of a horrible time was um, 
when his uh, personal record collection went on sale and all went all the money went to music counts, which meant tons to him. Anything that sort of put money into music with kids was was his, sort of his focus all the time. And uh, I went to the store and watched it all go down and watching people just trying to grab up a small piece. And I got two beautiful things. I got, I got his uh, version of Blood on the Tracks, which was probably the album we talked the most about over the course of our you know 20 plus year friendship so but it really came out of those those tuesday nights of the horseshoe we would hang out and then he and i would inevitably head to sneaky d's and we'd be sitting there at four in the morning eating nachos and we just developed a long friendship that way I well him. i am very sorry for your loss yeah it's horrible well and we all we all miss bookie uh i mean i discovered bookie from cf and y and listen to him all the time. And uh, I mean, I've had Alan Cross on the show. We talked about how Alan got like, I don't know what they called him, like a guidance counselor or something. He had a weird title, but he got a gig at Indy 88. So people kind of forget that Alan hasn't always been at. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they forget there's some gaps in there. But Alan's at Indy 88 and he's like, you got to hire Bookie because Bookie was available. Uh, unrestricted free agent, yeah. we, might, we might call him. And then, the, yeah, like you said, died suddenly, uh, very young, and was still on the air at Indy 88, of course. Still and, he, on the air. and what I miss about, and I don't listen to as much radio as I used to, because I li- would listen to radio, and then I would love it when the DJ would tell you something about the artist or song, like would educate you. So it's like, yeah. we're not just going to throw up a song. We're going to, you know, Bookie had, uh, you know, great knowledge about uh, music, and he would share that. And that's why I always liked it when like, when Str- like Stromba would do this, you know, Alan yeah. Cross, of course, does this. But I need a little uh, context and not just the music. Yeah, he had his ear to the ground constantly about what was going on, um, you know, from multiple sources. When I think once you establish yourself as that sort of, that source, then the news starts to come to you, right? And then he's just repurposing it and putting it out. But he spent so much time every day putting a show together. And he was, he was, he was very meticulous and very much a... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? He just sort of followed the same patterns every day as he built up to his time sure. on the air. And like being in the room with him on the air when he was on the air was amazing. It was just a whirlwind. He was a rolling dervish. And I love doing interviews with him. And that transcends before we were friends right up until, you know, very close to the end of his life. Um, six days before he he uh, had his uh, aneurysm and collapsed, uh, we were at Jeff Tweedy together. And that was a nice sort of last memory to have been at the show we went out to dinner the night we went out to dinner before the show although it was to uh a very sort of um just because we couldn't we, we had little time we went to like a real sort of fast food pizza place which is kind of perfect actually yeah sounds sounds great i bet you dave hodge was at that tweety show but. oh i'm sure yeah, it, was, it was a really good show too <laughs> oh man and it's you know i mentioned just in passing i mentioned tomorrow night i'm at the horseshoe to see junk house yeah because uh, tom wilson is a great fotm and i'm gonna check it out and uh, of course, you were at the unveiling, right? There's the the bookie. Uh, yeah. What's that called? Is that like a historical the, plaque? Yeah, what is that? A, uh, what's something Toronto? What's their what's their not history Toronto? But they basically there's plaques all over the city sure. honoring locations, honoring people, and there was a few people that worked on getting that one put together and putting it in front of the horseshoe. Of course, makes sense. That was kind of Dave's home away from home, right? Um, but there was other places that could have been, although like the, uh, the radio stations are a little more off the beaten path. So it's nice to have it there. And I still sort of just get a little bit choked up every time I walk by there and see it. Well, I'll take a photo of it tomorrow night for yeah, sure. Yeah. Up in the, in, in, you were at the unveiling, like I said, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you and Bedini and he had so many friends who were great, you know, local musicians. So he was truly a friend of the, uh, the music. He totally was. And his friendship with the Rio Statics and those guys was long before I had met any of them. And, uh, yeah, they had some of the stories. If you ever get Dave talking about some of the early day stories of Bookman on tour with the Rio Statics, it's tr- truly, truly funny and amazing. Well, I'll get, I mean, Bedini's been out a few times. I'll get him back and we'll, yeah. do, a, we'll do a whole bookie segment. Episode. Speaking of bookie segments, so mm. again, uh, you're in this new documentary called Subversives, yeah. which is about Lois the Low. You're a founding member of Lois the Low. We might do, revisit that a little bit before we talk more about uh, the new album and everything. Sure. I've got it. Like I said, you could literally call for a song and I'll play it and then we'll get something live at the uh, the, the end of this chat. But there is a very nice tribute to Dave Bookman in Subversives and I thought that was a, a classy thing to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, like my it's it's a bit stranger for me because my friendship with him was, was almost completely separate from the band by that point. Really, you know, it wasn't... And but there's just no denying what his sort of influence on what Lois to Low became. It 
was just huge. You know, it started with um, Brother Bill, Neil Morrison, was the nighttime DJ when we released Shakespeare My Butt. And I was working a, a graphic design night job at that point, and I'd be sitting there, it'd be 3 in the morning, and I'd hear this song come on the radio, and I'm like, oh, that sounds really familiar. <laughs> and then it would be, it would, he was playing us. And that's where it started, with him just being a fan of that record and, and having a bit of latitude to choose his own songs. Um, and, you know... It grew from there, and uh, Dave certainly carried the torch for a long time. But I think I think he came back by it from an honest place. He really, really liked the band and liked what we were doing. So I'm always, as you know, I'm, I'm very interested in like who champions certain bands at certain stations, mm-hmm. and that was kind of a neat time in, at CFNY. Now, Brother Bill is a great friend of this program, Neil yeah. Morrison. I don't call him; he knows I won't call him Neil Morrison. It's uh, Brother Bill for me, but. Yeah. You know, we've talked about his love of Lois. The Lois Shakespeare, my butt being a, that was you know was a big deal to me. I close every episode of Toronto Mike with yeah. a song from uh, Shakespeare, my butt. This song, I will say this: there's the documentary subversives. I'll get back to the CFO, I think. Yeah. But there's also this. Um, you can get. I think you can stream it. Go to Simon Head's website, and you can find a way to stream yeah. this. But there's a track by track discussion. You and Ron and Lawrence chimes in too, of course. But there's a. Uh, and Andy Kramer. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I you re- had the masters in your basement. <laughs> well, so during the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of people did some deep cleaning, and uh, I honestly didn't know I had them. I know they would; they'd moved around a few times, and it was at a point where everybody had apartments that were too small. Somehow, I ended up with them. I didn't know they were still there. So, when I found them, we took them into uh, to Pheromone, and uh, they ba- sorry, Revolution was the name of the studio, but they they uh, baked the tapes, which you have to do when they're that old. Were and you nervous? Like you only get the one shot, is that right? Yeah, I wasn't nervous because like either they were gonna it was gonna work or it wasn't gonna work and okay. they were in the right hands, so right. so like if they it's were It's on them if it's messed up. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But if they were in my basement and already past the point of decay, then they were just garbage. Right. Um, but they worked perfectly and it really and I really liked that piece, that hour long discussion yeah. of that album. Because it really I want the thing that I think struck us all listening to the tapes was like there wasn't, we, we kind of expected we'd go in and find all this stuff we hadn't actually used in the mix, but there was nothing. It was like one, there was, I think we determined there was one guitar part in Under the Carlisle Bridge that didn't make it into the song. Wow. So there's a real sort of efficiency in the way we played those days, because we were, we were coming at it as a live band that was playing 200 shows a year, and that's the way we recorded the album, and uh, it's cool, because there's some, there's some more intricate playing on that record than I realized. No, it is. It's fantastic to go. So, what are the? So there are some songs though you didn't have the masters for is on Shakespeare. My right. I think it was. I think it ended up being just subversives, and it's probably because it was recorded in a different way with just like a Ron, Ron live off the floor. So that wasn't on the tapes that I had, and likely lost somewhere along the way. Like, you know, the thing is, the problem with being bad uh, archivists is stuff just gets thrown away. Well, I can't believe that was in your basement. Like all this time because <laughs> no, this is a 1991 album yeah I know and but just, just to be clear it had yeah. moved several times I didn't have it from the from the get go I think I think um, one of Ron's girlfriends had it at one point and oh. then it moved out of their place when that when it was uh, too small to hold and when it ended up with me I don't know because the house I had before that house there's no way I had it there it was just there was no room so <laughs> I don't know so this Again, I loved hearing you and Ron talk about uh, Bleed a Little Wild Tonight, which is one of my favorite Lois Little Lois songs. And the way your voices dance. So I'm actually going to turn this up for a minute. Mistakes are taunting me, and I'm hanging around in my old haunts. And I remember you telling me that Alex never gets what she wants, but you got someone, and it ain't me, yeah. I got myself again, but I just can't let this be. Yeah, I'll bleed a little while tonight. 
out tonight. What do you think of that, Stephen? Well, I think that you're listening to, you know, what how many years is it now? So you, it sounds like a different person from when I hear myself because it's so long ago. But yeah, I always was very aware that my voice and Ron's voice worked really well together. And it's it was nice to revisit that because, you know, I mean, like time and I guess time heals all wounds. I mean, we've certainly, he and I have had our troubles and we're and everything's kind of back to a place where everything's good now. Um, but, you know, this, we, we were... You've had your troubles? You know, I've seen the documentary, <laughs> Stephen, okay? There was an email, I believe, that was discussed in great detail. Oh, yeah, the email, yeah. Do you I still guess, have a copy of that email? I probably don't. I, yeah, it looks like, you know, how email programs change and <laughs> that would have been some kind of simpatico account. Right, you get you. you know, it's not like <laughs> Gmail where you don't delete anything. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> what do you remember? What you wrote in that email? Oh, my response was basically, "I quit." <laughs> this was this was a long email. Mine was very <laughs> very short and to the point. So, and, and this is what year ninety? What is uh, this? That would have been twenty twelve. Right, think. this yeah. is the second. Right, that's the second. Time, a, yeah. a, okay, yeah. so people should seek out subversives for the ongoing history. I will tell you, I had a moment at I was at a Sky Digger show last weekend. And uh, Josh and Andy are doing, uh, I will give you everything. Yeah. Okay. And their voices do this dance that yeah. it's really hits. And then I'm listening to that. And I'm actually thinking about the way your voice with Ron's works in Bleed a Little Wild tonight. And I realize like, I'm just a sucker for that. Like, it's just, like, it's like yeah. it's, I love it so much. It's so. really, I mean, you know, the, the idea of harmon harmony, when, you know, like I've heard uh, Graham Nash describe what the Crosby, Stills and Nash did as try right. not trying to be harmony, but trying to have three voices create one voice. And like, I think that's what we were doing kind of, kind of the same cool. thing. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's powerful. It's, it's like, it's great. And it's nice to be able to sort of sit back and realize that there was some good stuff done back then for sure. So brother Bill, big uh, champion of Lois to the low at yeah. CFNY. And then of course, uh, Dave Bookman, Bookie also a big champion as we just discussed. Yeah. Is there anyone else at CFNY you, you, you can uh, name check uh, who is a huge, like a, a booster of Shakespeare, my butt. Yeah, sure. Kim Hughes was, uh, was a big uh, supporter too. And um, you know, we did so much with those, those evening shows that they had back then. It's, it's hard to believe that that stuff, you know, doesn't really exist anywhere because like that was such a sort of look forward to moment in the course of a day where you got to hear, from the bands that were coming to town and what the sto stories that you wouldn't normally hear. Like, you know, as you said, a lot of people love context and often with, especially with like satellite radio now, basically you kind of hear the song and that's it. So having a place where you could go every night and hear about the bands that were playing in town, right. what crazy things that happened in the business, like, that's, that's great stuff. And it wasn't, it wasn't sensationalist. It wasn't like, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if entertainment tonight was considered sensationalist, <laughs> but it didn't strike me like that. Do, it was do, like kind of, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like just real stories about real stuff, which is great. Yeah, I believe, you know, because Scott Turner tells me all the time about the CRTC rules were foreground programming, like the, oh, yeah. the FM, like part of their uh, promise of performance with the CRTC was you had to have like informational programming and talky talk stuff like live in Toronto. Like I think it exists to satisfy some requirement with CRTC, right. but it's guys like you and I, we, we miss it now that those requirements have been lifted. Like we mm. absolutely miss the, that context and having a, somebody curate it and sort of like <laughs> what Dave Hodge did yesterday in Toronto. Maybe that's what podcasts are for now. Maybe that's what we're doing right now. hundred percent. And I also think that just the sort of the onset of the internet changed everything because now you can, you know, there was a time when if you had a band you loved, you would get one chance to see them a year, maybe, and one chance to hear about them a year, really, except for if you're like reading Circus Magazine or something sure. like you it just now you can basically if there's a band you love, you can look at them 24 hours a day and you can probably watch them sleeping if you want to. Like It's just it's a little bit over the top now. OK, I want to get to I want to get back to before the collapse yeah. of the hive. And again, we're going to chat more about it. I'm interested in how the cake gets baked. Uh, we're going to do a thing. Literally, all the jams are loaded up. I heard you say the word hornets. Yeah. Hornets started playing. It was like magic. That's AI at work. That's I didn't touch anything, did <laughs> I, Stephen? Awesome. Didn't touch a thing. So we're kind of going to do that in a minute here. I want to let people know. Actually, I'm going to let people know that I'm giving Stephen some gifts. So. Oh, nice. This, my friend, since this is your third time, you've earned a uh, wireless speaker. You can oh, connect cool. to it via Bluetooth. It sounds damn good. That's amazing. Thank you. Courtesy of Moneris. 
because with that wireless speaker, you're going to listen to season five of Yes, We Are Open, which is an award-winning podcast from Moneris, hosted by FOTM Al Grego. He was down here a couple of weeks ago. That was a great episode. We kicked out jams, talked about the new season. He went out east and he collected inspiring stories from entrepreneurs and small business owners, and then he shares them on this excellent podcast. So, cool. Yes, We Are Open, season five. And you need to invest your money wisely. I think your move to Wolf Island is amazing. Like, And I'm wondering, have you had a winter on Wolf Island yet? Well, I certainly spent a lot. Of, you know, it's funny because a couple of friends of mine, when, when I sort of made it known that I was moving there, one of my friends took me aside and said, you can't do this. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you don't, you don't know what a winter's like on Wolf Island. I said, well, I've been here enough in the winter. He said, no, you don't know. You don't know what it's like. Right? So it's coming and I'm going to... We're going to... You're going to report back. Yeah. We'll get you back. Okay. Because yeah. they do have lots of snowy owls. This is a big thing on uh, Wolf Island. They right? do. I've not seen one yet, but there apparently is a place you can go and they're a little more prevalent, but it, it's, you know, I mean, lots of deer. The deer, uh, the deer are, when you go out in sort of the back roads, I've seen deer like jump the entire road, like two lanes. Wow. It's, just, it's like you're watching like a deer take flight. I, I do. I will tell you, I want to get to Wolf Island oh, to, next yeah. summer. And what's this hotel that Chris Brown has? Like what's, what is this? Uh, so, so I guess two years ago, three years ago, Chris uh, bought the hotel Wolf Island with a partner and named Tom Carpenter. And they've turned it into a number of things. It's a real community hub, but there's a two amazing live rooms the, the island itself right now is a bit stymied by the fact that the ferry construction on the new docks on both the Kingston side and the Wolf Island side have taken forever. And it looks like we're about to get the ferry coming into the village again. And that will change everything because literally you, you know, you can get from Kingston to the Hotel Wolf Island faster than most people can get to the Horseshoe in Toronto. Like it's just a, wow. and they are bringing in, you know, I think five times a week, there's amazing music every, almost every night. So not uh, the least of which will be me this Saturday. So Okay, so this is like, I mean, I think I said this. I think yeah. I said this last year, but I mean it this time. <laughs> I need to carve out a weekend yeah. in the summer of 2024. I want to go and check yeah. all this well, out. Like I, I want to document it all, check I out what's going on. I can help you with that. Yeah, you should come and do some episodes from there because there's, well, first of all, the street that I live on is yeah. like pretty much, you know, except for a couple of people, all musicians of <laughs> some renown. Uh, uh, you know, Jason uh, Mercer, who was part of the Bourbon Tabernacle Choir, played with Ani DeFranco for years, is a producer extraordinaire in his own right, just did the new Gertrude's record, which is really good. And uh, Chris Brown, as you know, um, Rocky Roberts is on the street too, and he worked for, he was Neil Young's guitar tech for many, many years. And wow. uh, it's just like, there's just this clutch of, and that's that's just the one street. There's artists everywhere, and it's a real nice little community. It's a small community, and the hotel and a couple other places are kind of the centerpieces, and... You know, it's different than Toronto, that's for sure. Yeah, we're losing a lot of our great Toronto artists to you guys out there. I mean, it's <laughs> a lot like, like a drain, uh, artistic drain. Okay, I will shout out uh, FOTM Gare Joyce because he up and moved to, during the pandemic. He up and moved to King uh, Kingston. Oh, yeah. And he tells me he when he was younger, he would get mistaken for Stephen Stanley from Lois of the Low. Really? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll show I'm, you a pic. I'm, I'm sending my deepest sympathy for that. <laughs> no. um, Kingston, too, is a, is a, uh, a lovely music scene. Like, I'm really right. digging what's going on there. I mean, it's the, I, I don't know... I don't know the science behind it, but the number of live venues per capita, it must be higher than most places, I would think. I, okay, the road trip, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, okay, it's uh, totally worth it. I was just in Montreal. I drove right by. Yeah, I got to make stop, a stop next, stop next summer. Okay, so all that is to say that you can learn how to plan, invest, and live smarter with the Raymond James Canada podcast, The Advantaged Investor. Whether you already work with a trusted financial advisor or currently manage your own investment plans, the Advantage Investor provides the engaging wealth management information you value as you pursue your most important goals. And that's creating great music, Stephen. That's what it, you do. Okay, That's what I do. There's a measuring tape courtesy of Ridley Funeral Home. Oh, cool. You never know when you have to measure something. That's great. So, And uh, fresh craft beer from Great Lakes Brewery is yours. Awesome. And I have a lasagna for you. Uh, now... 
I don't know where you are tonight. Like, what's the plans for you well, while you're in the... Yeah, tonight's, tonight we're uh, here in Toronto and then back to the island tomorrow for a show. So, um, uh, you know, I'll gladly take it. It was the highlight of the last visit. With, like, well, no, it's yours. Yeah. I'm just w- hoping that you have a, a <laughs> freezer. You keep can, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so. It'll probably thaw before we get back, <laughs> but we'll, we'll figure it out soon. All right. Well, yeah. but, you know, it's none of my business what happens to that <laughs> lasagna once it leaves <laughs> the premises. Not I'm not liable. If, <laughs> yeah, but it's frozen solid. Well, it's cold outside. I feel you can store it outside. Just don't I let think, the yeah, raccoons okay. cook that up okay so so you're getting the lasagna let me see if i've got everything oh recycle my electronics if you on on wolf island you have any old cables or old devices or old electronics that you need to get rid of you know i feel like you've got a bunch of stuff because you just found the masters of shakespeare my button so you go to recyclemyelectronics.ca and find out a place near you you can drop it off and it'll be properly recycled so the uh, chemicals don't end up in our landfill you got it steven i got that that's great Okay, Um, that's essential. Give me the details. I know a lot of places are like, "Oh, that's in the weeds, man." I'm like, "Get in the freaking weeds, Stephen." Like, I'm good to go in the weeds. Okay, so and again, as you talk to me about this, feel free to shout out, like, say, "I want, I want a straw man, whatever you want," and then that'll come in, and then we can play with it. It'll be awesome to do this. But like, where did these songs come from? There's 11 songs on this new album. We've already heard one and. Don't make me play the song you're going to play, obviously, because it'll. Oh yeah, I'll keep. I'll keep keep away from that one. Keep away from that one. Um, you know, half of these songs were kicking around pre-pandemic and we were getting ready to go in and make a record and then that happened and, you know, being at that point from Toronto where the rest of my band's from as well, uh, we couldn't go to the island. We we had to wait and when we finally got started, we got into it and then the pandemic caused a couple other breaks that one of them was a longer one for nine months. So it took a long time, you know, and going back and forth, I, I kind of just loved the the vibe of making a record there. I've obviously made records in studios and cities and both in Vancouver and Toronto and all over the place. Um, and there's a little more of a regimented feel to any sort of studio work when you're especially close to home because you've got to go in there and you go out. With Wolf Island, it's all completely not regimented. It just sort of happens when it happens. There's often a lot of conversation. People drop in. Um, and a lot of the sort of arrangements happen because of, oh, somebody comes in and we put them on vocally. We put them on playing banjo. Sounds so like heaven, Stephen. This sounds pretty, like, like, cool. like uh, in Field of Dreams when he's, cool. uh, he's like, "That's Idaho." It sounds like heaven. Yeah. So, but so it is heaven. And about half the half the songs came uh, were written during the pandemic. So when we went in the studio, the band didn't know them, and that was a lot of fun. So we reverse engineered all of those. Where I started with a vocal and an acoustic guitar, and then the band built it backwards. Where usually we would do the rhythm section first and build this on that way. So that was cool. And Straw Man's a perfect example of that because that was really kind of pieced together, piece by piece. I knew what I wanted to say and I knew what the lyrics were going to be. We're going to play it tonight live for the first time, which I'm actually a little bit nervous about because there's a lot of words in this song. Just fake it till you make it, Steve. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Okay, let's listen to a little bit of Straw Man. Oh, my ashen glow. The old moon in the new moon's arms. I doubt myself, maybe this didn't happen exactly as I remember it. It's been a long time gone. But it happened, and by that I mean it really happened. Sometimes you have no choice but to doubt your own memory. That's the way it is. The mind's eye remembers something, believes in a pinpoint accuracy, until somebody else takes that pin and bursts your fever dream wide open, and it spills out right in front of you. A river of half-truths rushing away before you can soak them all back in. I'm incandescent, you burn as you get too close. Sanguine desires, I'll serve you a lethal dose. One moment strong, and the next moment gone. It's that vein in your neck, you can feel it right there. Not sure if something is pumping towards your brain or away from your brain, but you know it's moving know it's altering everything you thought to be true but see consciousness begs for something more than just salience it's not just what came before but what might be possible come what may the narrative is a beast and the beast must be constantly fed to survive but two people two people can read the same story those exacting words and the end result is two antipodal meanings that barely resemble each other at all so yeah it happened but that means almost nothing I stood unaltered, you measured, defeated Took what you could, never got what you needed I named you, in the process I named you I 
was already defeated I was already singing that tune And I would have stood by And watched all that dust fly And my love was the earth shine By the spare sliver of the moon And you stood up in front of everyone With what appeared to me to be a Cheshire grin There are a lot of words in this, Stephen You're gonna, <laughs> I gotta hear how this sounds tonight uh, You know what, I, when you were doing the oh, Well, this part too, but uh, I was thinking you were gonna say All I wanted was a Pepsi <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, why is I almost, can I go back and just, uh, yeah, it's my show, Stephen, you can't you actually do, stop You do whatever you want. Okay, hold on. It's been a long time gone, but it happened, and by that I mean it really happened. Sometimes you have no choice but to doubt your own memory. That's the way it is. The mind's eye remembers something, believes in a pinpoint accuracy, until somebody else takes that pin and bursts your fever dream wide open, and it spills out right in front of you. A river of half-truths rushing away before you can soak them all back in. All I wanted was a Pepsi. All I wanted was a Pepsi. Which, it's no joke, Brother Bill has kicked out on this program as one of his favorite songs of all time. Suicidal Tendencies Institutionalized. So it's all oh, connected, nice. man. Yeah, it is But great, connected. this is a great song. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it was a... So Kate's vocal was recorded in um, New York, and I heard... Heard it for the first time when it was coming back. It came back to uh, Wolf Island, and it was just—it was so moving. It's just amazing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all going to come. So you're going to play that live tonight. Who's going? Is, is Kate's not here, right? So Kate will be here tonight. She yes. will be here tonight. Yeah. You know what? I, I wish I'd known. Like I've been working on getting Kate Benner on Toronto mic, and oh, I didn't know bad, she was yeah. in town. She's really in for one day. She's got to remember me when yeah. these things are happening. No, no. What's going on? I need to be uh, high on the radar here. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Is this like one of the older songs on the new album? That's one of the newer ones, actually. Okay, that's a newer yeah. one. Okay, yeah. sorry. What? So, tell me the name of the song that you're gonna sing live. Uh, oh, shortly. today I, th- I was thinking I would do uh, "Here Comes That Rain." Okay, I'm just gonna isolate that track so mm-hmm. I don't. Okay, what do you think is the oldest song oh, that's on um, the album? Hey, Darlene. Hey, Darlene. Okay, yeah. let's go taste that. <laughs> Yeah, hey, Darlene, I like a word with you. Cause you've been thinking out loud, and none of that is true. When you talk through your hat, well, no one wants to hear that. I hate Darlene. I hate Darlene. I hate Darlene. Ooh, the return of the prodigal son. Let's not get caught up in that section, but you burn his affection. Hey, Darlene. Hey, Darlene. Hey, Darlene. Hey, Darlene. Ooh, light a fuse and let it burn. There's a lesson to be learned. Burning missives, dripping wet in gasoline. I guess the deepest blood connection somehow leads to. Infection of the body, mind, and fully let it clean. Hey, darling. Hey, Hey, darling, I'm flattered just the same. You talk a lot about me and take it all in vain. When you whisper in the night, oh, does your left hand know the right? Hey, darling, hey, darling, hey, darling. 
Hey, Darlene. Who's Darlene? Oh, that's that's what that's a story. I'm, you know, I find that with writing music, there's like um, that's about just gossip. The song's about gossip. I, you know, and I probably do have a, an actual reference point, but there's some things things I like to keep to myself and let people. There's like I. In a live show, I tell a lot of stories, and some of the stories are very directly about the songs, and others I like to just let them kind of percolate and be be what they are. Yeah, everyone has their own Dar- Darlene, right? I think the world's full of it, of Darlene, and they're they're often uh, sorry, it's they're okay. often male, the Darlenes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's no can't apply a gender to this this Darlene here. Okay, amazing. Uh, I want one song in the background while we wrap up the talk because then you're going to tune that guitar yeah. and we're going to get something live, which is amazing. And I'm going to even record it on my phone here, which would be cool to get that video. But uh, what name check another song that's not Here Comes the Rain. Um, why don't we? Like, do you have a favorite song or are they like your children? Yeah, you it's kind of it's kind of like bouncing around. So let's let's talk about Chase That Devil, um, which is the first song on the album. Um, we just did a video with Sean Ryan that I'm really happy with. And I don't know, I just like that this song kind of happened really quickly from a writing point of view and was inspired by watching the news one night and a politician. And this is the hard part. I really like to know my references and it was a late, late at night. I know it happened, but when I went back to try to find it, I couldn't find it. But basically, it was during a federal election. Politician in Ottawa, conservative, was asked... Uh, was asked, what are you going to do if you get elected? And he said, I'm going to chase that devil out of Ottawa. And I was like, this can't be political discourse anymore. This can't be what we're what we're talking about. But it is. Or it's, it really is. Be, has become such a big part of political discourse. And it passes off as something that actually has meaning, which it actually means nothing. So, so yeah, I took it and made a sort of built a whole song around it. It's usually what happens. Usually one line triggers a whole narrative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like, and maybe, you know, because it's late at night, you're watching the news. It could even be like you mishear it just a little, like, and you kind of, because I, I I feel like yeah. that's a that's a line I feel would be indexed by Google somewhere, but uh, chase that devil out of Ottawa. Yeah. No results. Wild. Okay. Let me hear a little bit of this. And it goes like this. Chase that devil. Chase that devil. joke's going to be on you. I hear that in the next uh, federal election, Pierre Polyev is going to use this as his uh, theme song. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Because I can hear the crowd now. Chase that, that devil. That like, that it kind of riles you up, the mob mentality. I'm like, let's <laughs> let's tear down a wall. Let's let's make some hopefully, shit happen. Hopefully the, hopefully the verses will deter him from doing that. No, it's uh, like when uh, Ronald Reagan used uh, Born in the USA. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and uh, what like Trump pulled all kinds of songs Tom Petty and the yeah. village people like he was using everything he could get his hands on um, I, I, I really just listening to the song with you I just wanted to say um, yeah. I haven't mentioned my own band which well this is it talk yeah, to me about yeah, your band because their plan on this record is just like stellar Chris Bennett is the guitar player um, that's his work throughout this song I think some of the guitar playing he does in this album is just mind blowing to me and the rhythm section is Chris Rellinger on bass and Cam Pysiak on drums and they just did some amazing work as I said, a lot of it got pieced together in the studio this time because there wasn't the 
the, there wasn't the availability of pre-production because we couldn't get together for the moments we were making this record. So. But that's kind of neat to have it kind of organically piece itself together on the on the floor like that. Yeah, I love it, and I think that's probably how I'll make another record if I make another record, just to try to go in with no pre-work and just try to build it that way because it's so much love fun. Okay. So much happens. Well, it's like before we started recording, you're like, uh, uh, I'll tune my guitar. And I'm like, no, we're doing that live. We'll do like, that live. I even want you to tune the guitar live. That's yeah. where I'm at here. And I think I said this to you when you came over with uh, Ron Hawkins and Chris Brown. I said, you have an affinity for Chris's. Like, this is clear. You <laughs> like, If your name is Chris, Stephen Stanley yeah, is going to want to work, with, work you. with you. Like Chris Brown, Chris Bennett, Chris Rellinger. Uh, and then uh, yeah. DJ Chris Powers is a uh, sort of a guy on the island. Well, he's like, he lives in Kingston. But he was around. He wasn't around for this for this record just because of the pandemic. But he was around all the time during uh, the making of Jimmy and the Moon. So, yeah, Which the is, room by was. By the way, that Chris's. song's still great. Uh, you know, every time uh, I, think, I think. Did you play the most recent grilled cheese challenge? Not this year. Okay, I did two, two years, years ago. ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then yeah. even when that song, when you were playing that song live, I'm like, it, that's a great jam. Yeah, I thought we had a really good set that day. It was a fun. It was a fun one for sure. I feel Long like, lineups for the grilled cheese, that's all I'll say. Well, you know who uh, <laughs> won that year, the grilled cheese challenge? This is not a joke. I know this. <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let well, you. Ridley Funeral Home yeah, won, won that year. And I know the last year that uh, Ridley came in second, I think, last year. But another uh, competitor in that is uh, Great Lakes Brewery. So like, there's oh, a yeah. lot of Toronto Mike sponsors that are involved in the grilled cheese challenge, so Stephen. I, I can say that the year that Ridley won, they were well-deserved. It was a really good sandwich, that's, that's for sure. Been, oh, my God. You could be like the celebrity uh, grilled <laughs> cheese flipper, man. Okay. Where are you going? I'm going to Ridley Funeral Home for grilled uh, cheese. You know, <laughs> if you eat enough of those grilled cheeses, you'll be at Brad's door. You'll be calling Brad for a pickup here. Okay, so soon... In moments, mere moments. And I'll do play by play. You can tell what's going on. I don't know how to tune a guitar. I need to know what you're doing with that sure. guitar tuning. And then we're gonna you're gonna play live. Yeah. Uh, do you, what was the name of the first band? I don't know if it was in high school or whatever, but the first band you were a part of, the Deadbeats. It was uh, me, Andy Koyama, who produced "Shakes for My Butt," and uh, his originally his brother Gord, and who else was kind of John? I forget John's last name was the drummer. Oh, and John Arrow was the bass player. And it was a fun group of guys. We we did. Andy wrote most of the songs. We did a sort of a mix of covers, and uh, you know, this was probably like 1987, and we had a we had a pretty nice little run of playing live when we rehearsed down at Johnny McLeod's space on Queen Street. And I haven't seen Johnny in years because of you know my rehearsals have taken me other places. But um, at one point, I was his longest running uh, uh, client at that jam space. That, wow! That now is in is now down uh, more in uh, the Baldwin area, but. Uh, he's still at it though. Okay, and what was the name of your the second band you were a part of? Second band, second major band would have been Popular Front. That yeah, was with Ron okay. and Dave. And Popular Front, yeah, uh, people who don't know the origin. If you don't know the origin, go go see the documentary. It's all in there. Yeah. But uh, what did you think? And I know you were involved in it, and you're very close to it. But again, you're not in the band Lowest of the Low anymore. So what 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 did you think of Subversives? Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, you know, I missed the uh, Toronto premiere because I, I got sick a couple of days before and couldn't go. And I actually went to the doctors that day and said, I'm supposed to go to a premiere tonight. Can I go? And he goes, no, you can't go. <laughs> uh, it wasn't COVID, though, but he didn't want me out in public. So that was fine. So I ended up going to um, Alora and watching it in this amuse this amazing sort of little limestone theater that they have there with surround sound and a room full of people. And it was a great experience. And uh, um, Uncle Harry and the kickstands did a courtyard set outside before the movie. It was just a great night. Um, but yeah, I really like it. You know, it's like, I'm probably, I, I saw it, I saw many parts of it as it was being made because I was, and because Simon's very forthright. And uh, I, as you probably know, I did four different interviews for it. So, and then the, then on top of that, the interview for about Shakespeare, my butt as well. Right. Um, so I saw a lot of it leading up to it. So I, there wasn't, there were some surprises, but I had a pretty good sense of where it was going. Um, you know, I mean, what can you say about a story that you're involved in? Like, like, I, and, I, and your involvement is really interesting because because Ron is this constant, yeah. of course. But then there's you, and you're there for the the Shakespeare, my butt, and then what is it? Whatever after hallucinogenia, hallucinogenia, yeah, yeah. Uh, and. <laughs> Getting, uh, I had uh, Ron Hawkins in the backyard, and we were talking about Don Smith, and that's in the documentary yeah. too. But it's just very interesting because Paul Langlois was down here and talked about how amazing Don Smith was to work with, and then I was like, I was going to pull a clip of Ron saying like how horrific the experience was for him. Well, so that's yeah, that was one of the things that you know that particular story that got told about Don. Like I, either I've willfully uh, admit, omitted it in my mind, or I just didn't remember it happening. But uh, it was uh, it wasn't great because. Don 
during the making of our record found out he was going to be producing the next Rolling Stones album. And once that happened, yeah. like those were his friends, like Petty and Keith Richards. He uh, was often in the studio loft on the phone with them for hours while we were recording. And you would hear, he, we'd be doing like bed tracks and we'd finish a song and there'd be like this 30 second pause. And then the talk back would come on and he'd go, again. Right. And that was all he'd say. And you know, for all I know, he wasn't even listening. But so there was some there was some troubled times. He he took the tapes to uh, to California for a week, like in the middle of the session that wasn't expected. And we were living in Vancouver, so we now had a week of downtime just just sort of kick around the city, which wasn't all that bad. But he said he needed to put percussion on it, and came back with what I think was two cowbell parts, and one of them was. <laughs> One of them was a cowbell on a song that Dave was already playing a cowbell. So uh, there's some <laughs> weird stuff like that. But I'll, I will say, and th this is where I, I suspect um, Paul Langwa comes in on this story, is that I got to spend some late nights in the studio with him doing guitar work. Yeah. And he loved the guitar. And he was a wizard. Like it was, And his energy during those moments, and, you know, those extended moments, because I think it was two or three nights where it was just he and I and the engineer in the studio and we were working on guitars, it was infectious. Like it was just to see somebody so passionate, passionate about sounds. And I think, you know, in the end, it's a lucid, you need a great sounding record. I probably not. Like it's sort of a, of its time. Oh, you know, what I was going to say before, yeah. um, Andy Koyama has, uh, remixed all the, uh, Shakespeare, my butt tracks, all of, all the raw tracks. And it, it's really, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I don't have a lot of skin in the game now, but, um, I'm not sure if they're going to release it huh. or not, but, um, it really sort of makes it really updates it. So you get the same, it's the same music and the same recordings, but it's just kind of takes away a little bit of that early nineties over use of reverb. That was really, I mean, you can hear it on that album. Everything's just bathed in it. Um, and it was nice to hear that, hear the album that way. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's out there and whether it's like when they did the uh, let it be naked. Do you remember this? Yeah. Kind of but the, with let it be naked. They, they stripped yeah, a lot of uh, George Martin stuff out. Right. There was nothing stripped out of this. He just, well, it wasn't George Martin, right? Wasn't it? Uh, the guy who killed oh, his it was wife. Phil, it was Phil Spector. Uh, Phil Spector yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. The guy Phil who Spector. killed his wife. Yeah. That guy. Okay. Yeah. All right, right, that's problematic too. Okay, so uh, Don <laughs> yeah. realized uh, you got to have more cowbell. I think that was what he said when he, he was listening wanted more to, cowbell. Okay. I think I think what he wanted was a, a week off in uh, in <laughs> California, <laughs> which is no, it's for sure what he wanted because like there there was no work done. He had this whole backstory about working with um, Tom Petty's drummer, and I just don't think any of it actually happened. He probably put a cowbell on the plane. <laughs> way back <laughs> so okay so uh there's an episode of toronto mike dropping tomorrow morning which is uh it happens at the end of every month it's the ridley funeral home memorial episode and we talk about those we lost that previous month so we're going to talk about people we lost in november 2023 and one of my conversations because his mentor passed away in november 2023 is going to be with perry lefko so if you could take a moment obviously you don't need to talk about perry shout yeah. out to perry lefko but Perry's brother, Elliot Lefko, yeah. his role in the, uh, was it 2012? When, uh, when, when was the big, uh, earlier, that was, two, earlier. That was 2000, two, uh, oh, 2001 oh, okay. and 02. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And there were so many there, Stephen, who can keep track? Okay, there was, we did too many reunions. Yeah. He was instrumental because I think throughout, whenever the conversation of doing more shows came up and I think for six years, everybody said no. When he, when he got involved, he was the guy we all trusted and we all thought that if someone was going to handle it. Um, and there's still like, there was a lot of uh, courtship to be able to do it, but we started right. getting together again. And then once we got into the jam space, we realized it was probably going to be a lot of fun. And it was, it was, those, those were really great shows with those first reunion shows. Um, but Elliot's just such a, he's such a lovely guy. Uh, other, and also a really good friend of uh, Dave Bookman's and um, he just knows his stuff so well. So it, it, in those hands, we knew something good was going to happen. It really was. We had a great, Sort of, uh, we did um, Toronto and Buffalo, and excuse me, and then and then we did uh, a run out west, and then um, ended up being the amphitheater show. And he wasn't involved directly with the twentieth anniversary thing that ended up in Massey Hall, but that right. wouldn't have would have never happened if he hadn't gotten involved in the first part. Okay, so from lowest to the low to the Stephen Stanley Band, uh, now's a good time to get yourself ready there, prepare. Yeah. So I'll give the play-by-play -play here. In fact, I'll put a little something of yours in the background while this all happens. How about the Winnipeg? There you go. Oh, you see, okay, everybody, play-by-play. -play. Stephen Stanley just knocked over my Fuji Feather single-speed bicycle, so I'll be sending an invoice to Wolf Island. <laughs> 
All right, don't worry. Just yeah, just lean that against the. Uh, don't worry, that was an accident waiting to happen. Uh, <laughs> the Winnipeg Sun is uh, oh gun. It's a big difference. Uh, <laughs> Mike, put on your glasses here. The Winnipeg Gun is playing in the background. That's from the new album from the Stephen Stanley Band. It's called Before the Collapse of the Hive. Stephen's got a guitar now. He's picked up my bike. Okay. <laughs> Don't hit your head, Stephen. Oh, even I, I, I dodged that one. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, I tried to warn you, but uh, you can lead a horse to water. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I've been uh, blessed by the tuning gods. That's good. Really? See, that's yeah. why I didn't want you to. It's kind of strange on a day like today because, like, you figure a, a two-hour drive plus uh, this weird damp weather would do something. But... Maybe this guitar likes that kind of stuff. Okay, so what happens between your visit on Toronto Mike and your performance tonight? What is going to happen with Stephen Stanley? Yeah, we're like it's going to be uh, hopefully a couple hours of uh, getting something to eat. But I think um, we start pretty early with soundcheck. I'll be there at three, three thirty, and then uh, getting ready for the show. And you know, so like the band, uh, Chris Chris Brown's rehearsed with the band, and the band sounded great. And Kate, this will be the first time we've played Kate live with Kate for a long time, so wow. that's going to be fun. Amazing. Okay, yeah. stick on those cans. Yeah, I have a second mic. I can open up this guy if you want. Like, oh, can, sure. Yeah, okay, you tell so, me. Yeah, okay, that so. could be the guitar. All right, yeah. Professional operation here. Yeah, you might have to move the chair a bit, swing that guy over. Okay, now I have to send him an invoice for that microphone. <laughs> you're, you're gonna, you can't afford this visit. It's like, yeah, well, luckily the label, sell that co- lasagna. the label will cover everything. They know I'm, they know I'm destructive, so. <laughs> oh, now that I know that, break more things. I need uh, new stuff. Okay. <laughs> That sounds nice. So is it in tune? Okay. It is. So hold on, because I want to record. I mean, I'm recording this, obviously. This is. Uh, should I have recorded this conversation, Stephen? <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? You did an interview, and then they said, oh, shit, I don't have it? Uh, t- not interviews, but certainly with some music stuff where you thought you had something great, and it didn't uh, didn't actually make it onto the tape. So, Or the tape. And you're like, I'll what's, never what's sound tape? that good again. What's tape? Yeah. Yeah. I still say live to tape, even though, okay, so I'm going to get my... Go. Where are we here? Oh yeah, you look you look camera ready here. Okay, I'm so I'm ready. gonna start recording this, and then uh, the floor is yours, Stephen All right. Stanley. Thanks, Mike. This is uh, called "Here Comes That Rain." It was actually the first. Do we call them singles anymore? I don't even know. And when you put a song out on the streaming service, this is the first one that came out. It goes like this. <laughs> been baptized and circumvented, moralized, infantilized and schooled. Gaslit and dog whistled, overheated, melted down and cooled. And I've been stood up and worked over, and demagogued and dropped on my head. If my story's almost written, then Yours is still yet to be said But here comes that rain You've got my eyes Push past this pain Into the light of sunrise, oh Here comes that rain And I was pleased by the progress And I spun in time to see the bubble burst And I woke up the watchdog Just too late to recognize the worst And I've seen daylight and darkest hours With real tears Right before the dawn and Beaten down by populists So take back that hill And you'll live on and on and on and on and on But here comes that rain You've got my eyes Push past this pain Sunrise, oh but how come this water keeps rising And no one seems to pay it any mind This water keeps rising And your body's turning it to wine Beaten, unbeaten, 
path And stomp your own grapes of wrath and Cut the time it takes to make some sense of all this pain and half Cut the time it takes to make some sense of all this pain and half Cut the time it takes to make some sense of all this pain and half One, two, three, four I've had your eyes locked on mine And I couldn't hide the plot that we lost So rage against or die by And rewrite this poem at all costs But here comes that rain You've got my eyes Push past this pain Into the light of sunrise Oh Here comes that rain Rain, rain, rain Amazing, Stephen, and Thank it you. even rained because uh, it rained. they knew the you were going to sing that. That was fantastic, man. Thank you. I always it's can't a, believe it how talented a, it's you it's are. It's a rocker with the band, and uh, that's a nice one to play acoustic to. We're going we're gonna to start the show with that song tonight. So, oh my God! So we're going to yeah. close this show, and you're going to start that show. It was perfect. The album's called "Before the Collapse of the Hive." Uh, if you were king for a day, how would people consume? Your, your new music on Before the Collapse of the Hive. Well, if I was King for a Day, I think, you know, as many people as possible listening to it on vinyl is kind of the way to go. It's, a, it's nice that this has been, there's been a resurgence, but honestly, Mike, I think I'm just happy if people listen to it, if no matter where. I'm not, I'm not sort of precious about, you know, I mean, there's a, I obviously understand the argument about streaming and band camps better and all that, but if people listen, that's, that's good by me. And remind people, uh, if there are any tickets available for tonight, yes. uh, where do they go to get tickets to see you uh, for the release of uh, the the release party for Before the Collapse of the Hive? Yeah, I think tonight will be, uh, what's left will be at the door, which is at 1300 Gerard Street East. It's called the Redwood Theater, and doors are open at 7. So yeah, come. It's going to be fun. Did you know you play on this song? I know that. I was told that. I don't know. I don't remember being there, but <laughs> <laughs> the uh, whatever we're calling it, Shakespeare, my butt. Uh, reproduce. Who's the gentleman? Spell the last name of the gentleman who remixed this album. Well, he actually did the first produced the original version. Right. It's Andy Koyama, K O Y A M A, and uh, he's he's a film music mixer out in uh, California now. Um, but you know, did an amazing job. I mean, that mm. album. Basically, is the reason I'm sitting here. So, it's, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, we don't know that. Lot. We have to go through the, the sliding doors and see what happens <laughs> if you're <laughs> not true. in the. Yeah. We, we don't know, but it did grease the grease the wheels here. Greased but the wheel. thank you. This is your third visit. You hit it out of the park again, and I can't wait for your fourth visit, man. You're you're amazing. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure being here. I need to hear that new remix version of Rosie and Gray and see if that becomes the new closing theme song. Right. So uh, tell them to send it over. Yeah, I need, uh, I need a, to hear that ASAP. That would be a good place for it to go, actually. <laughs> yeah. to, uh, and by the way, in that one hour uh, where you talked about the songs on Shakespeare My Butt, I was hoping when you got to the Rosie and Gray song, you might mention, you don't have to name me, some podcaster uses this uh, to close <laughs> everything. That might have been in the extended version. It's like There was a lot of conversation that didn't make it to the actual cut. I think... Simon shot so much stuff for that for those those docs. Boy. Shout out to FOTM Simon Head. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of our 1378th show. Stephen, I used to follow you on Twitter like S Stanley oh, Band, yeah. not but there anymore. you're not there anymore. So, where would you like us to follow you on social media? Yeah, follow on uh, on Facebook, which is just Stephen Stanley, or on uh, Instagram, which is also Stephen Stanley. 
Um, and my website is the Stephen Stanley Band, Stephen com. Um, so, yeah, I kind of got out of the Twitter thing. I was chastised for that the other day because uh, a, a, fr- a guy that was a friend of mine that was posting about my new record said he couldn't tag me. Well, I actually so. experienced that exact same thing yeah. yesterday. Stephen Stanley's, and I'm like, where is he? Because he used to be a Stanley Band. Yeah. But I don't blame you for getting off. Like, I actually. Uh, I'm on. I'm still on Twitter as Toronto Mike, but I created a Blue Sky account at Toronto Mike because when Elon's right there, like when when he goes at, it's, I'm close. Like once yeah. I bail on Twitter, I'll just do my tweets on Blue Sky, whether anyone's there or not. Right, Blue Sky. I don't even know that. Okay, well, so I'll I get you an invite. Got to do some looking. <laughs> um, yeah, I was told that I should probably start a banned Twitter account again, just so there's something that people can to tag. tag yeah. yeah, right. Just make our lives easier. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Much love to all who made this possible. That's Great Lakes Brewery. That's Palma Pasta. That's Raymond James Canada. That's Moneris. That's Recycle My Electronics. And Ridley Funeral Home. See you all. Well, it might be Ashley McIsaac this weekend, but if it's not him, it'll be John Lawrence from Spacing. We've got to talk about Ontario Place. See you all then. <laughs>